Thank you, uh, Dr. Moldepong. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, before I begin, I, I would like to thank uh, the provost uh, and members of the selection committee for the opportunity to present my research today. Uh, and especially, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, in the Department of Social Sciences for their ongoing support and encouragement. And it's such a, a wonderful thing to see students here today, so um, it's a pleasure. And Harry's been wonderful setting this up, so I really appreciate it. Thank you, Harry. Um, so I'd like to begin my uh, lecture today uh, with an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, this slide captures that. Um, Essentially, what I'm going to do today is uh, use my analysis of interviews with young women in New York City to demonstrate salient findings on the causes and context of young women's violence. Uh, for example, I will present findings on uh, the meanings and consequences of young women's involvement in violence in their peer relationships uh, with each other in particular. Uh, these findings include uh, the sociocultural context of girl fighting and young women's fight for friendship, justice, and respect. And I'll talk about what that means uh, through the course of the lecture. In the presentation of my research, I will use the terms girls and young women interchangeably in order to preserve the language of the, yeah, that young women used to talk about themselves and each other. So I'd like to give you some background for the research before we think about how girls talk about and experience violence. And let me give you some background uh, of what we know about youth violence um, as a starting point. <clears throat> the study of youth violence predominantly focuses on males. And in general, uh, there is a paucity of research to understand young women's aggression and violence. There's limited amounts of research in that area. And historically, uh, theories of crime and delinquency have ignored or misrepresented women and girls. For example, uh, feminist scholars have argued that young women's violence has been trivialized, or that um, in comparison to boys, um, it's minimal uh, in relation to boys. And so girls have been compared to boys and their violence has not been taken seriously. And also scholars have argued that uh, young women's violence is masculinized. That is, uh, the notion that violent behavior is perceived as masculine, as a male trait. So when women and girls use violence, they are acting like males. And in addition, feminist scholars have argued that young women's violence has been criminalized or the notion that we punish young women and their use of violence, and particularly young women of color, for their perceived gender transgressions. So we punish not only women's violence, but we punish their behavior because it's perceived as male behavior. As a result of this uh, feminist tradition in criminology uh, tells us to include women and women's voices in research about their lives. The predominant focus on males and violence by men and boys has contributed to a number of problems for understanding young women's violence. First, there's a uh, limited generalizability of these studies to young women, particularly young women of color living in urban neighborhoods. So the findings of what we know about boys does not translate into what girls do and what we know of our girls. The exclusion of women and girls in violence research has contributed to a dearth of theories uh, to explain why and how young women aggress. Specifically, we have very limited understanding of young women's pathways to violence. That is how they uh, find themselves involved in violence. Consequently, the factors that precipitate young women's violence have remained largely uh, unexamined, that there's not been a, a sufficient research in this area. And 
So the focus of, of my research is on uh, something called relational aggression and its relationship uh, to young women's violence in their peer relationships with other young women. So what is relational aggression? Um, it's, it's mean girls. And um, many of you have heard about this probably as uh, bullying. Uh, so relational aggression is another term for bullying. Uh, but by definition, relational aggression is a serious form of aggression that aims to harm social and peer relationships through the use of gossip, uh, rumors, rumor spreading, ignoring, and purposefully excluding others. And this form of, of aggression has been found to be common among females. It's not that boys and uh, men don't engage in this behavior, but it's common uh, around in females. And this is predominantly the way uh, women, young women, uh, aggress. In addition, uh, research shows that relational aggression has serious social and emotional consequences for both uh, perpetrators and victims. Uh, and um, those include uh, loneliness and peer rejection and having social problems in general. Uh, also depression and uh, su suicidal ideation or thoughts of suicide. Um, and in some cases, uh, suicide. And you probably know that from um, high-profile media cases of, of, of suicide and bullying. Um, one of the questions that I was interested in was, what is the role of relational aggression in young women's physical violence? Uh, there's some preliminary research that suggests that relational aggression may be a marker for serious forms of overt aggressive behavior. However, the evidence is limited, so again, we don't know a lot. And um, a review of the existing literature on relational aggression demonstrates that most of this research focuses primarily on children and early adolescents, young adolescents, uh, and that those populations are, are predominantly from white middle class backgrounds. And in addition, these studies often examine both males and females together, um, and so have homogenized gender and not looked at the so much at the gender specific issues uh, to girls and boys. Um, and most of these studies are of, on relational aggression are predominantly quantitative in nature. So as a result of this, um, these studies do not reveal information about underlying issues, uh, interpersonal processes, why it occurs, why, and the causes and meanings. Um, nor do these studies provide an in-depth understanding of young women's lives in a way that would allow us to learn more about young women's social relationships, specifically from their own point of view. And in general, there's a lack of qualitative studies that explore young women's experiences. And so I was interested in how is relational aggression important for uh, understanding girls' violence. There is a, a growing uh, recognition that girls are frequently uh, involved in incidents of violence towards each other. And these behaviors increasingly uh, fit the definition of violent offenses, resulting in girls' trouble with the law. Uh, the question, are girls becoming more violent, uh, is a public concern as well as an, uh, an area of academic interest, growing area of academic interest. Uh, this is uh, particularly relevant for social work and its social justice imperative um, to respond to the needs of disadvantaged, marginalized, and oppressed populations who have been under-researched and underrepresented in the empirical literature. Uh, the emphasis on the involvement of individuals, families, and communities in shaping our understanding of social problems, I believe, is the first step in the development of uh, gender and culturally responsive social policy and programs. So policies and programs that attend to pay attention to culture uh, and gender. And social work is about the inclusion of marginalized experiences. So considering attending to and sometimes just voicing issues and experiences as the first step uh, to empowering communities to address key social problems of which youth violence is one. Uh, it also provides information for direct social work practice. 
OK, so let me uh, tell you about my study. Um, a review of the empirical literature demonstrated uh, a dearth uh, of individual perspectives from young women themselves, particularly older adolescent uh, girls and young women. And to address this gap in the literature, uh, the central research questions of the study were exploratory in nature. And this study asks uh, specifically, how do young women live and experience relational aggression and violence in their peer relationships with other young women? And what are young women's subjective experiences of relational aggression and violence? That is, how do they feel? Um, what are the effects? Um, how, what, how do they describe these experiences? And what are the stories young women tell about their lives? And also, what are the socio-cultural contexts of young women's aggression and violence, the social and cultural uh, um, context that influences their use and involvement in aggression and violence? And so to explore these questions, I used a qualitative method of inquiry uh, capable of eliciting experiences through personal narratives or stories. Um, the sample consisted of 19 African American and Latina young women ages 18 to 21. I conducted individual interviews with the uh, young women and I, they were recruited uh, from community-based uh, youth development organizations um, in New York City. Specifically, uh, I used a narrative method of qualitative inquiry. And um, I chose this method because it privileges the stories that young women tell about their lives. And that was uh, exactly what I was interested in uh, finding out about. Um, and I used the listening guide method to analyze the narrative data. So um, the listening guide is um, a method that is feminist. It's relational and it's voice-centered. Um, and it was developed by Carol Gilligan and her colleagues. Um, and it involves uh, uh, four steps or listenings to the narrative. So once I would have a transcript after an interview, I would, um, I would look at that narrative, that document. And I would go through these four steps based on uh, using this method to analyze or understand the data. And the first step is uh, listening for the plot, or the participants' stories and the events or incidents, memories that they experienced. And then I uh, went on to listen for, so, for voice. Um, and, and what this means is that there are some ways in which young women talk about themselves that uh, reveals uh, aspects of who they are themselves and their relationships to themselves and other people. And then um, I listened for different strands of meaning in the text before the final step of composing an analysis. And composing an, anal an analysis consisted of creating interpretive summaries. Um, and, and I compiled uh, themes or patterns across all narratives that I found in, in the individual uh, uh, data. Um, it's important um, that I talk about um, this from a feminist perspective, as it is uh, the point of this uh, research was to amplify girls' voices. Um, and feminist qualitative research using the listening guide method begins with something called the reflexive researcher. And the researcher uh, uses re re reflexivity um, by locating herself at the forefront of her investigation and recognizes the impact of the researcher's own intersecting identities, so her race, her gender, her social class, in the research. And also uh, acknowledges the issues of power in the research relationship itself. So feminist qualitative research asks, why did I do this research? And how do I situate myself in this investigation? A feminist qualitative researcher transparently explores her own values, uh, personal biases, and the assumptions she brings to the research. And so in my case, I wanted to tell you a little story about how I came to this research and how my interests developed. Um, in my case, I have a clinical background uh, working with young women in New York City. And before I embarked on this research, 
I spent a lot of time listening to girls, their stories, and hearing about their experiences. The girls I, I worked with uh, brought me into their life worlds. I listened to how young women talked about their peer relationships with other girls, uh, their conflicts and their friendships. Not only what brought them together, but also what broke them apart. So I was interested in both sides. I also have a background working with young women in groups. Uh, here I viewed live enactments of these relationships, so how girls are related to each other in a group and watching group dynamics. Um, and I heard vivid tales of young women's experiences on the streets and in their neighborhoods, and they brought me right there uh, with them. Um, I became very interested in how young women talked about their lives and their relationships with other girls and their community. I became interested in the context of violence and what it looks like and how girls became involved. I was also interested in learning more about the factors, for example, individual and peer and family and community factors, as well as social and cultural factors that provoke violence between young women, and also the factors that interrupt these patterns, what keeps it from escalating and erupting into a fight. So that's what I was interested in and what brought me here. And so I'd like to share with you some of the key findings um, of the research to give you some insight into young women's experiences. Uh, one key finding that emerged was that girls use different forms of relational aggression. Uh, and there were three main types that emerged in this research. Direct uh, verbal relational aggression in the form of uh, verbal attacks, harassment, insults, name calling, envy and jealousy, or what girls in this study referred to as girl hating. Also, uh, the young women in the study uh, used and talked about using and being involved in indirect uh, forms of verbal relational aggression. So for example, gossip and rumor spreading, talking behind another girl's back. And also they used nonverbal relational aggression. So eye rolling, dirty looks, ignoring, and socially excluding other girls. So I think what, um, as an overview, I think what this finding illustrates is that when we talk to young women, we get a complicated picture of relational aggression and the meanings and the different forms, uh, as you're going to see, and how young women understand their experiences. Uh, and that these different forms of relational aggression really represent an expanded definition of relational aggression that goes beyond covert forms of aggression in the definition. So it's not just about talking behind somebody's back or spreading words. Sometimes this is direct forms of aggression, um, verbal attacks, insults, name calling, in front of, as one girl said, in your face. And so uh, the first illustrative quote is, words hurt. And I'd like to read uh, this and the, and the narratives for you. Um, words hurt, like, you know, harassing. And I think mostly that's where it starts at. You would think, like, OK, well, it's just words. And you know how they always have that saying, sticks and stones won't break my bones, but words will never hurt me? I really think that that's a lie. I really think that actually it's a myth, because words hurt. I just wanted to give you just a second to think about it. Um, and um, in my interpretation of these findings, uh, you know, clearly it does re represent direct verbal relational aggression, relational aggression as harass harassing and harassment. Um, but I think it also speaks to the painful emotional experiences of harassing that provokes violence between young women. So the impact of this and the effects of this um, can uh, provoke violence. Also, the young woman who um, shared this narrative with me was a self-identified lesbian young woman. And she reported a long history of being targeted uh, for her gender nonconformity, that is not looking um, like a girl or female enough. And so she had expressed a long history of being targeted for her gender nonconformity, not conforming to what girls are supposed to look like. And uh, interestingly, she also talked about the uh, history behind words, or the notion that if you have a traumatic history, 
the effects of these words are even further compounded. So um, that if bad things have happened in the past, that if someone calls you a name, that that could be very emotionally re-traumatizing uh, for the person. Another key finding in the study was that relational aggression is a precursor to violence. Um, I, I, we're talking here about experiences of envy and jealousy and hurt and betrayal that trigger incidents of violence. And then when we describe these experiences as cruel and degrading, an attempt to humiliate or, or embarrass or mentally hurt another girl. As one young woman said, um, the main thing that starts girl fights is he say, she say, gossip. That's it. Across narratives, girls spoke of how their experiences of envy, jealousy, hurt, and betrayal trigger uh, incidents of violence. Uh, this narrative represents one aspect of relational aggression that is uh, gossip as a precipitant for girl fighting. Basically, me, from experience, the only reason I don't really associate with girls is because of their phoniness, because of the gossip, because everyone just wants to fight each other when it comes down to, oh, whose side are you on? Like, don't put me in none of that. So here we begin to see the influence of the peer environment and pressure in the context, and also the strain on young women's relationships. And they did talk about this throughout their uh, narratives. Another key finding in this study was that girls uh, fight for respect, reputation, and, and loyalty. Um, the girls I spoke to talked about the sociocultural context uh, of violence. Essentially, this finding represented uh, girls' urban community life stories and it reflected young women's fight uh, for respect and also demonstrated a will to fight in certain situ uh, s situations and situational context. Uh, and this finding really uh, represented a fight for, for, for survival and a fight for relationship. Um, young women I spoke to talked about the importance of being tough and building a, a tough reputation. Um, and there were, in this finding, emerging themes of fairness and justice and what was considered to be right and wrong. Uh, and specifically, uh, the idea that sometimes you have to fight, and some fighting is justified. And so I'll go on to share some of the narratives with you that exemplify this. And I'll begin with uh, fighting for respect, which reveals young women's um, view of the importance res of respect in their uh, world. And they refer to their world as the world, and the world I come from, and where I live. And they talked to me about that world. And, and, and these are the narratives that emerged from that. Respect, you have to have it. But just the fact that it was disrespectful, like I'm talking behind their back. You talk about me to another girl. I mean, like, you can't be disrespectful because it's like you wouldn't want somebody to do that to you. Or like, like some girls take it as if you disrespectful. Oh, I want to fight you. I want to do this to you. Like, respect is like, I don't know, it's just like uh, you have to have it or people look at you differently. So respect in this narrative, is, it's, it's an essential quality. You have to have it. And it's really uh, conveyed as non-negotiable. And uh, this finding brings in important aspects of uh, what scholars have called uh, street code, or the idea that there are certain rules that govern the streets in urban communities uh, th that are beyond laws that we know about, that are upheld by the police, for example. Um, and that these street codes are prevalent in impoverished communities. Um, and these themes really foreground the themes of survival that uh, these young women adopt. And that we've known about, I think, more in boys than we have in girls and young women. They fight for their respect. I mean, like, if they fight, they fight for their respect. Either it's because they talk about them, they hear us talking, so they confront them, or somebody gets and somebody just hits you because they hit. And so this um, 
finally accentuates the fight for respect or the notion that if you do ado adopt street code, that it's a form of protection and safety. Um, and this finding, I believe, also uh, represents the, uh, an affirmation of young women's identity as strong young women. And I refer to this uh, in my research as a relational paradox of fighting for respect, but not, respect, not respecting fighting. Um, and that's because young women didn't believe that fighting was good, necessarily, um, or that they wanted to do it. But it was the idea that you had to do something that was perceived as bad uh, to get something good, which is protection and safety. And uh, I'll also talk about fighting for, for reputation. How can I mess up your reputation? People think it's not important what the next person thinks about you, but to us girls, it's very important. And you know, nowadays it's like, how can I, how can I mess up your reputation? You know, how can I get people to think about you what I think about you? In this example, we see uh, the impact of, of, of rumor spreading as an, an attempt to damage someone's reputation or name. Um, these experiences, again, provoke violence. And the idea that your name is all that you have, and it's the name, actually, that your mother gave you. And you'll see an illustrative quote of that um, shortly. And so protecting your name is really about honor. It's about honor. And the importance of mothers, interestingly, emerged um, as a significant uh, theme in, in this study. Um, having my mother's name in uh, your mouth was a cause for fighting. And uh, mothers were actually uh, present during girl fights. In some cases, um, believed that it was important, again, as a mode of survival, important to say that. Um, yeah. And uh, fighting for friendship. Uh, this finding really embodies uh, young women's subjective experiences of friendship. So on the other side of violence and, and, and relationship violence with peers, um, young women talked about what they referred to as ride or die friendships. And stories about ride or die friends represented themes of sisterhood. Uh, in my research, I found what other feminist, feminist scholars have found before in the past, and that's that female friendships are sustaining, and they buffer girls from risk. Uh, in this study, the meanings of ride or die emerged as loyalty, or the ride in ride or die, uh, and the notion of unconditional friendship with other young women. And no matter what, and that's the die in the ride or die. And it represented the will or the willingness to fight for female friends, who young women referred to as sisters and family. Um, and I think this finding also amplifies um, the different ways of knowing. The feminist scholars talked about ways of knowing, women's ways of knowing. Uh, representing women's intuition. And so the young women I talked to talked a lot about their own intuition, um, how they knew who to trust, who they shouldn't trust. And there was always a way in which they talked about it um, that captured me and was capturing. Uh, and the way they talked about this way of knowing was, my flesh, you go with your flesh. And I thought that was very poignant in terms of um, their experience, emotional experience, representing their intuition. Conversely, uh, ride or die uh, also represented feelings of betrayal uh, when friends who were supposed to be ride or die friends did not reciprocate. So there was a sense of uh, feeling let down um, in ride or die friendships as well. Fighting her for her. We grew up together. We was but we wasn't as close as we are now. I just put her under my wing because I didn't like the way people used to treat her. So when I fought that girl, I was really fighting her for her. 
And so this quote um, signifies friendship as a buffer from risk and victimization and the decision to fight also, that there was the element of choice. And that this choice, um, perhaps I theorized, um, is rooted in uh, women's, young women's ethics of care. That the idea of her, the caring could motivate fighting is somewhat of a paradox. Um, and that this is a strength, that this way, this caring is a, is a strength for um, young women. And it's, it's an inherent strength. Sometimes it wasn't even my battle. Some girls I didn't like. I, I used to have a nasty attitude problem. So it was just like, uh, you looked at me the wrong way, boom. Don't look at me. It just used to be like that. And I used to get arrested. I, I had to do time for a few of them. And sometimes it wasn't even my battle. I was fighting for other friends. I used to take up for everybody, like I was the hero for somebody, like I was everybody's shield. So again, this is a fight for friends and fight for other friends. Um, and she gives up herself in a way that uh, is not mutually beneficial. It's not in a mutually beneficial way. Um, but she pursues fighting and she pursues this relationship with violence. Um, so she puts herself at risk. Uh, despite the knowledge of its consequences. Uh, but it's interesting that she has insight about it. She can sort of see what's happening. Um, so for young women in this study, involvement in violence was not so much about breaking the law, and she acknowledges that she was arrested for this, um, but it's also about maintaining another code, and the code of, of doing what is right and, and caring about your friends. And that was upheld strongly. Bread and butter. I have to explain to her, OK, like, I got your back regardless. I'm not going to let nobody mess with you. Or I'm not going to let nobody beat you up. Like, they didn't do nothing to me, but they know you're my best friend. They know that we like, you know, bread and butter. Similarly, this finding constitutes friendship as a protective factor. Uh, young women using their relational strengths of connection um, to uh, protect themselves. And I find it interesting in this quote that she says, they know, they know, two times. And it's, uh, it, what it reveals, I think, is the fact that this is not just about me and you, the private relationship that we have. This is a public issue. This is a problem. And it's, it's, it's everybody knows. Everybody knows. And that's important as part of the code for women. Um, and this represents what you are expected to do in a ride or die friendship. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fighting for justice. And I think this demonstrates the active uh, um, agency in, in girls fighting and um, other aspects of, of, of fairness and right and wrong. That's why I had to really beat her up. She was my friend, and she stole from me. And I felt like I'm the type of person, if you ask me, I'm going to give it to you. There's, there's no question about it. That's how I am. That's how my mother raised me to be. Like, instead of her doing that, she stole from me. That's why I had to really beat her up, because I told her, and then she had made, she had my mother's name in her mouth. And I know she said something. And it ticked me off. So here we see um, the finding that uh, it, I think elucidates the complexity of fighting motivated by feeling betrayed in a friendship. In this case, betrayal was in the form of stealing and mother insults. But you can see that the young woman, um, the belief in the breaking of the code um, as a problem, and she broke the code, she stole from me, and she insulted my mother. And, and so here, fighting is inevitable. Um, you broke the rules, but it's fighting for what's right. I only fight for my life. I don't start fights. I only fight when I have to really fight. Like, I'll argue with you, but to fight, I only fight when I have to, I only fight for my life. 
And this narrative really uh, exemplifies what all of the young women talked about, and I think it captures it uh, best, the idea of that women have to negotiate the streets. That, uh, and that, that's every day, on a day-to-day -day basis. And they don't choose to fight, so we shouldn't demonize and criminalize. It's important. And um, that women are often fighting to defend themselves. And that ultimately, this narrative represents young women's fight for survival, and the ultimate survival is, is her life. And so my talk uh, today is the more fights you have, the less fighting you have to do. And I, I think this um, quote really captures um, what we need to think about when we think about girls' violence, uh, and particularly the socio-cultural context of girl fighting. It's just like, you know, basically fighting nowadays, it's like promotion for yourself. The more fights you have, the more people know your name and know of you. The more people know of you, the less fighting you have to do. But better believe you got to have to have a good amount to get that status. Because it takes a certain amount of wins for people not to want to F with you. And that's what a lot of girls try to achieve, too. So this narrative exemplifies the importance of building status among peers. Um, this finding, I think, also encapsulates the meaning of fighting and the notion that you have to fight to be left alone, which, again, I refer to as a relational paradox of fighting, that you have to fight to be left alone. And the expectation is that you fight. And the fact, and the fact is, if you don't fight, you were perceived as weak, and as young, one young woman in my study said, a weak link, suggesting a chain um, of command. So the expectation is that you fight and become a fighter. And some of the young women I talked to believe that you were turned into a fighter even if you weren't one before. And I just uh, reflected you know, on the idea that um, to earn the privilege of not fighting, that not fighting is a privilege. And I, I, I found it very interesting. It's important in this um, conversation, dialogue about um, interrogating young women's violence, to think about also, uh, from a social work perspective in particular, um, also the, the girls have relational strengths and resiliency, and that emerged very clearly in my research. Um, in this study, not all girls uh, fight, um, but all of the girls did witness experiences of fighting. Um, I also found interesting that some girls avoid fighting, and they talked about staying away and the different strategies they used. And I was, uh, what I learned is that um, that they were often saying is that they stay inside. And so that um, was like a red flag for me from a social work perspective. The idea that women would, young women would stay inside um, leads me to start thinking about interventions. You know, How can we help young women to be uh, able to be out in public spaces? Um, and also the fact that girls fight for respect but don't respect fighting it becomes evident in their uh, in the finding that they have relational uh, strengths. What also emerged in uh, my research is that there were a lot of other female figures that um, were buffered young women or protected them from their involvement in violence. And those were very vivid uh, narratives about mothers, grandmothers, sisters, uh, close female friends. Um, and so it's important to uh, uh, convey that the strengths perspective is also uh, a way of um, looking at violence broadly. If we look at young women holistically as a whole person, uh, we don't just look at their behavior as bad and we don't demonize them. We, we look at them as people and, and we try to understand their experiences in order to intervene. Uh, So uh, in conclusion, um, 
this study did show that girls uh, do engage in violence um, and that incidents of relational aggression precipitate girls' violence. And I, I do um, think that it, it illuminates the relational and socio-cultural context of girls' violence. These are young women from um, urban neighborhoods in New York City, uh, impoverished urban neighborhoods. And I think that when we do qualitative research, um, we begin to reveal some of the complexities of young women's fighting and involvement in violence and start to understand a little bit more from their perspective or their point of view why they're involved. And that's critically important. Um, and I think it's critically important um, in terms of the implications of these findings for direct social work practice and policy. Um, and there are some important recommendations that I um, think are important to include and talk about uh, with these findings is that um, it's vital to include girls' experiences um, in the development and implementation of gender-specific and culturally responsive policies and programs. So we need to uh, talk to girls themselves, hear about their views, and find out what girls' pathways are to violence because how girls arrive at their involvement in violence is not the same as how boys uh, arrive there. And there are specific, unique patterns for young women that involve their connection to others and relationships. Um, and that when we develop these programs, that they also need to be culturally responsive. When I talk about culture, I'm thinking about broadly um, the idea of the community as culture and urban communities as culture, as well as uh, ethnicity and race and social class and sexual orientation. In addition to that, uh, when we talk about girls' violence and we think about intervention strategies and ways of assessment, we have to promote girls' relational strengths and resiliency. If girls are willing to fight for each other, there must be a way in which we could um, exploit those relationships for helping them to um, reduce their involvement in violence or their impulse to use violence in situations that would potentially put them at greater risk uh, for juvenile justice involvement and for you know, arrest. Um, and so that's what I mean by culturally uh, uh, responsive and gender specific. And uh, I would like to conclude by um, just pointing out a handout that I sh uh, shared at the desk. Um, it's I'm incarcerated and girl are uh, called I poems. And um, these are narratives of young women themselves that I constructed based on the methodology of my research. So the metho methodology of my research called for creating I poems to demonstrate how young women talk about themselves and their relationships. And these, uh, the I'm incarcerated really amplifies, I think, the sociocultural context and the life experiences of juvenile justice involved girls uh, that I spoke to. And girl in illustrates uh, identity. Those are identity poems and identity narratives about how young women talked about themselves and each other. And all the different names and words they used um, to stimulate conversation about the importance uh, and meaning of being a girl in urban communities in New York City. And so thank you for listening. Okay, in your research on girls fighting, do you believe or did any of the girls admit that daytime television like Jerry Springer or Maury Povich plays a strong role in condoning that fighting each other is okay? Yes, it's, it's really an excellent question. I think that they, the young women I talked to were very much influenced and felt the influences of this kind of aggression and violence was rooted in culture, culture broadly. That included uh, TV, uh, music, um, and the importance of having things, material things, um, and that that was part of status. On the one hand, there was a sense that they felt disempowered because there was a search for, and a lot of the envy and jealousy was rooted in uh, wanting what other people have. And that, I think, 
came through in their discussions about the importance of wearing uh, certain sneakers and uh, wearing Prada and what, what happens if you can't do that. Um, these are also the vivid images that came through, I think, uh, the television media about what women are supposed to look like. <coughs> Interestingly, a uh, hair emerged as a significant theme. Uh, the, unfortunately, there was a narrative of an experience of a young woman who talked about uh, having, uh, was reflecting on an experience when she was in uh, high school where uh, a, a group of girls cut off another girl's hair as a form of violence. And um, that what was rooted in this discussion was the idea that her hair was really beautiful. It was long, uh, she had more of it, and it was desirable. And so underlying that was the jealousy about um, you know, the attraction that she was uh, getting from both boys, males, and females. Um, so to uh, remove that was to remove her power. You know, and, and yeah, so I think when I think about those, um, you know, television and media and uh, uh, there was a lot of hype around that that uh, promoted girl hating or girls not liking other girls. That culturally, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and feminist scholars have referred to this as internalized misogyny or horizontal violence, violence that happens between girls because we internalize um, misogynistic ideas and beliefs. None of the girls I talked to agreed with this, but they were, uh, you know, couldn't resist, I, I suppose, the cultural pulls and pressures and strains um, surrounding this. Oh, can I ask one more question? Um, when girls fight each other, you know, in your research, over men, friends. Why is it that they find it hard to blame the man mm -hmm. instead of blaming each other? Mm. Can you explain that to me? It's, I, I think it would be such an, uh, an interesting area to pursue in further research. Um, I, I think that, you know, the idea that they could fight girls and young women Maybe, perhaps, and this is me theorizing, that that was something that they could do or relate to doing. That um, maybe it was just uh, more, it was more of an opportunity. Perhaps. That what would it mean really uh, to, to go uh, for the young man or the male or the boy? With such a, 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 an imbalance of power between them, the risk was much greater. Um, and maybe that response is too simplistic, but the idea that you know they were pro it's a way of protecting themselves, I, I don't know, uh, but it's a very interesting question. Because that is a greater form of risk, right? Um, yeah. of self-esteem being low or high uh, playing a factor in mm. violence or staying away from violence? Oh yeah, that's a yeah. wonderful question. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, when I talk about girls' strengths and resiliency, I think that's what really came through. A number of the girls that I talked to were college-bound. They were heading for college. Um, they felt that they had come to a place particularly the girls who were involved in the juvenile justice system, and not all of them were, um, that they had come to a place of developing that, uh, what they referred to as my core. And my core was their own sense of self, their self-esteem, how they felt about themselves. And self-respect, self um, they talked about quite a bit. And so, um, that is the part where I think social work could have a strong impact. And building programs to foster young women's self-esteem and fostering their relationships and getting along and addressing conflicts that they have with each other directly. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, congratulations, Rivera. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me there's a great deal of interpretation going on here. I have happiness there. I was wondering if the subject matter you studied was studied by others. Uh, if the subjects were studied by others? Yeah. Oh, yes, they certainly have. Uh, this research really is in the. And, and how do you make it? Uh -huh. Um, yes, um, right. Uh, I, this study really um, is part of a, a history of feminist uh, scholarship um, and ethnographies, uh, particularly um, in feminist criminology and sociology um, that looks at girls' violence in particular, not relational aggression. Um, and so the, the methodology, qualitative research, is in inherently interpretive, um, and that's what the that's the way that qualitative researchers believe we uh, can know and learn and and develop knowledge is through uh, an interpretive understanding of other people's view of reality. Um, that there are multiple realities and there's no single truth, and so. Qualitative research opens up a, a pathway for um, that interpretation, not only of the participant, research participant, but also of the researcher. And I forefront that when I come, when I when I talked about my own experience, uh, my social work background, and what I'm bringing to the research in terms of my identity, and the idea that the way that I interpreted this um, could be uh, attributed to who I am. Um, and that's part of being a feminist qualitative researcher is to acknowledge those, those issues of power, that who is constructing knowledge becomes important to think about and understand. There are ways in qualitative research to um, check findings. It's called trustworthiness. And it's a way of um, basically saying to a participant, um, is this narrative capturing what you said? And um, it's called member checking, and it is a form of um, um, validity, uh, checking the validity of findings in quantitative language. Um, and I did that with two of the 19 members. Um, and I think that's a limitation of this study, that it was only two young women that did participate in the member checking. Um, the young women read the narratives and they, they talked about it, uh, what they were reading. And um, it was interesting bec because they didn't necessarily want to change anything. They didn't sort of oppose or dispute anything that was written. Um, what was interesting to me is that when they read their narrative, um, it was sort of like a, an experience that affirmed their identity. Like, wow, this is me. Yeah, this is really me. I said this. It was sort of like having their names up, up in lights, you know. Um, and so, the, uh, it, you know, the fact that it captured their voice, I think, is really um, the important piece of this. Uh, and that you want to do that rigorously. Um, and the way that I do that is by using what we call in vivo codes. So while I'm interpreting, I'm also using the language that women use, young women use. I think I s have struggled with this whole issue of language, young women, girls. You know, when we talk about young women, and how old are girls? And when they talked about themselves and each other, they, talk, they, talk, they used the word girls. And so my uh, preservation of that language, I think, is um, important in terms of rigor and trustworthiness and establishing the credibility of the findings. Yeah. I've got two or three questions. Sure. One is kind of methodology and one is kind of content. On the 19 that were part of this research, mm -hmm. what would you see is the generalizability of the findings of that 19 to a larger mm -hmm. unit of analysis, whether the unit of analysis is New York City, or the University of Analysis is a borrow of interesting 
interested in hearing about mm. that too. But the other question has to do with the issue of reputation and messing up. So we don't look for large ends. We look for small ends, the numbers. And we go deeper with those individuals through other ways of uh, collecting data um, and broadening the perspective of the, that, that reality that's being captured there. Um, and so no, there is not that claim. Um, to your second point about messing up in technology, it didn't emerge as a theme in my research. Um, I, I think overall, globally, I think what was interesting about studying this population of young women is that they were older adolescent young women. And they did talk about uh, technology not in relation to them, but in relation to younger girls. And so again, it's an opportunity for intervention, I think, um, for them, that it wasn't at that stage for them. They, they didn't feel, they didn't talk about that so much. I'm sorry? Yes. Right. I, 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 um, it's, an, it's important to think about the differences between qualitative and quantitative research. And my belief is that they complement each other, um, that qualitative informs quantitative, and that we should do both, really. Um, and, and then more. Being yes. a here. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal. I actually, um, in terms of generalizability, I understand what you're saying, uh, but actually some of your findings are found in mm -hmm. the quantitative research. Uh, for example, and I was struck by a number of them, but let me highlight one, the emotional social support that young mm -hmm. people receive acts as a buffer to all kinds of negative outcomes. So you're finding, you know, fits in the literature that that it uh, uses a different method. Yeah, yeah that's that's. So, th th yeah, thank you for raising that because that sort of um, confirms, validates what what uh, I believe, which is the complementarity of the methodologies. Uh, and so 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 there are qualities that they can do this in their lives, Yes. Um, so, one of these findings is totally is it that reputation? Because I'm thinking about the alliance of friendship, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the justice mm -hmm. may not be yeah. specific to the other issue. So, you know, yeah. this is an opportunity to think about ways that we can reputation that matter. Yes, yes, and it's those factors, the meanings that they attribute and ascribe to their use of violence and involvement in relational aggression, what are what I'm suggesting would be the um, way to provide culturally responsive programs. So taking into consideration that um, young women believe that they have to fight or that reputation is important or that respect is important, that is specific to their environment. Um, and so in order to develop programs that are effective, uh, I think, we have to take that into consideration for young women as well as young men. Um, so yes, when I think about culturally responsiveness and, and social work being at the forefront of that, that we, we, have, we look at the person in the environment, so, and that's the environment. And this informs our, our practice, is essentially. The movie is about jealousy, it's about white Right. It's about the white population. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question because 
actually that was one of the interest, my interests in this, was that most of the rela relational aggression research in the <coughs> mean girl studies uh, looked at uh, white girls. And I think what's different is that, well, young women of color are, are getting arrested and being put in jail. Um, and, and so that's why I was interested in relational aggression as a, as a possible pathway to violence and criminal justice involvement. Um, and so there have been, you know, there's a debate about whether or not we should include this relational aggression, or is that not policing normal girl behavior? And so there's a controversy, but I think the experiences are different um, when you, with, with between the two social classes in terms of the research. Um, Dr. Rosenthal, and then, I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. Oglensky, and then Barbara. Um, I guess um, some, there are two issues that I've been interested in in terms of girls' violence or women's violence. And one is about the role of anger and the other is guilt. So, I mean, the way that it seems that the girls are framing their violence um, is not fueled by anger so much as it is a fall for self-esteem or um, kind of a, a you know, respect or honor code related. But um, so I, I wondered if, um, you know, sort of what you read or what you see as the role of anger and envy and competition. And then on the other side, the consequence of being violent, of hurting other girls, like did the girls talk about the damage they did in hurting other girls? Do they talk about the, you know, guilt or remorse that had done that? Just I think those, I think particularly the second part might, if we understood more about that, that might help leverage also some responses mm -hmm. in social law. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such an interesting question, yeah. Um, I, I have to say that across narratives, the young women that I spoke to were not quote-unquote angry. And I think that that is the this, this stereotype in the literature when we're talking about juvenile justice involved girls, young women of color, that they're angry and um, that that's what they do, unprovoked violence. Wasn't the case in, in my research. Um, and interestingly, there was a great deal um, in the finding on ride or die friendships, a great deal of expressions of um, remorse, uh, responsibility. Young women talked about this uh, as humbling themselves um, and wanting to um, make up, um, talked about, actively talked about uh, forgiveness. And there was something about their relationship that made them want to do this, that they would have to use their intuition to make a decision about whether or not this was the kind of relationship that warrant did that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there was a, a great deal of that. And I think what's interesting about l looking at anger is that it's more of an individual construct within the girls and women. And I think from the perspective that I bring to this, it's um, less about that and more about, again, the social and cultural factors. Uh, so we're not just talking about angry black girls, angry girls of color talking about young women who are strained. There are strains. That doesn't justify their violence, but, but um, in, it, it, it helps us to understand and contextualize their violence and experience of it. Yes, in your uh, interviews with the girls, did they reveal any of their feelings about why they would fight over boys. Because in my work with younger teens, a lot of the fights started over, over boys. And so it goes back to that young man's uh, question. And also, uh, you said they talked a lot about respect, respecting itself. Did they talk about how they felt about male violence against them? Because it seems to be a trend where so many girls are allowing themselves to be uh, victimized, mm. really, mm. by males, uh, where they're allowing males to dominate them physically and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, uh, yes, it was uh, a theme. The, um, the issue, I'm thinking about the issue of male violence, 
And uh, the young women did talk about it as a culture. And the way that they talked about it was how they are, uh, their bodies are sexualized and how young women will wear certain clothes uh, to present in a certain way to be attractive to uh, men and boys and that that will provoke envy. Um, it's almost like there's um, uh, a, a fight also for, th there's resources that, uh, capital that that's people are fighting for. Um, and the availability of boys and men um, becomes part of their um, belief about what's important. You know, you, it, it's a complete violation. And it's, again, a not non-negotiable uh, point, a flashpoint for young women. Uh, in one narrative, a young woman talked about an uh, incident of cheating, and the altercation happened, and she picked up a bottle, and that's where it went from there. And she broke the bottle, and she used the bottle. And there were only three girls in, in this study that talked about violence with a weapon, and that's not a common issue um, in most of the literature, and I think that was sort of came out in what I uh, did as well. She but, has yeah. a question. Uh, yes, in the back. I have two. Well, um, the first one, you didn't mention anything about mental health, and I actually think that plays a major part in, um, in these fights with the girls, because mm. um, a lot of them aren't taking their medication properly. And um, I think that is just one of the major mm -hmm. things. And um, do you think, well, the question, actual question, what was the start of your um, research? Because these things have been going on for years and years. This is not something new mm -hmm. where um, self-esteem issues and music and TV, you mm -hmm. know, being influenced mm -hmm. on um, young girls. Mm -hmm. so, what sparked your research for? Mm. These are great questions. Yeah. Yeah. I think mental health is such a, a, a huge issue and one that I think is, uh, again, more and more research needs to be done in that area. What we do know is that juvenile justice involved girls, about 98% of them have serious um, mental health problems. Um, that is because of violence and victimization in their traumatic histories and backgrounds sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, um, growing up in group homes, um, you know, sexual assault. And so these are very, very, very important um, um, areas of consideration when we are talking about interventions to complement. When we talk about gender-specific pathways, the ways that young women become involved in violence, and this is one of the most robust findings in the research, is it, it's through victimization. And that victimization is usually um, um, coupled with um, some history of, of mental health issues as a result of uh, having post-traumatic stress disorder, which a lot of juvenile justice involved young women have. In response to your second question, you know, this is not a new issue, and it's important to say that. Um, Young women's violent, women have been violent, are violent. Um, it's not a new issue. It's that we're paying a lot more attention to it now. And there's a lot of media hype around girls becoming more violent and are they becoming more violent. We see a lot of high profile cases of bullying that lead to suicide. I just, um, you know, I was reading about a case this morning uh, in Chicago of a 10 year old girl. Um, Caucasian girl and you know the words fat and, and ugly and these things prompted a, su a suicide um, so it's not new uh, we we're finding that it's very possible though that girls are expressing themselves more aggressively and more violently in addition to the fact that our police policing systems are um, punishing girls for their involvement. 
So we have systems now that not only are we paying attention to it, we're arresting girls for it. And we weren't always doing that. And that's in the past uh, decade or so. Um, we are increasingly arresting girls for this uh, behavior. And it's not uh, something that we always did. So I think that the, the changes in policy that led to increased arrest rates um, made us start to uh, panic about the problem of young women's violence and therefore pay more attention to it. Uh, and so I'm part of that generation, um, having done my research and collected this data, uh, started collecting this data in uh, late 2008. Um, and it was a, a qualitative research is a long and intensive and so it was a significant period of time that I was actually uh, collecting the data and then also uh, following that also an analyzing the data. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, by the way, I have uh, no knowledge of what have worked, but I have intellectual curiosity. I have yet to see special of intellectual whose subject of research is outside the digital culture. Don't you think mm. it may be for that people? for the sake of comparative knowledge to study white girls and come out for comparative knowledge. Hmm. I, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it... But why is the tendency to focus on people of color? Hmm. Is it the accessibility? I don't know. Hmm. I'm really confused. <laughs> 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 what do you think the uh, uh, Oh, the question is, you know, why are we focusing so much on people of color? And as a woman of color, you know, wouldn't it be uh, useful to focus on white girls? And, huh? Comparatively. Comparatively. Um, I, uh, I guess I'm, I'm coming from a, a, a premise that we haven't focused enough on young women of color. And the ways in which we have focused on them has been negative. And my, um, I guess, sort of ethic about my research is to, to bring their voices into understanding that it's not enough to compare boys and girls, it's not enough to compare blacks and whites, um, that we have to really listen to what young women say and what they talk about. And that in and of itself is knowledge. And it's empirical. And it's important. And I, I, I'm not sure what the rationale for me would be of the comparison. Uh, I th you may focus more on the black girls if you haven't studied the white girls. I'm gonna. I, I think it's a good question, to, and I want to think about it because I, it's a good question because I, again, it brings me to the whole idea that I bring myself to the research. Um, but yes, Dr. Rosenthal. Uh, I'm gonna respond. You didn't ask me, but, but in, in the quantitative literature in general, this is a sweeping generalization. Historically, research has focused on white males, and then more recently, males of color. There has been much less research in general on people of color for historical reasons, uh, negative reasons, when they were involved, the bad things happened, so they didn't want to participate understandably. There is a huge push from the National Institutes of Health to include not exclude, but to make positive steps to include people of color, women, and children, because they have been less well represented by far historically. So when you apply for a grant, for instance, from NIH, you have to show if you're not making big steps to include people of color, women, and children, 
why you're doing that. Otherwise, the expectation is you must do well, it. Why was I that so? I think that, that, would, that would be a, Why don't we do that for a, a conversation on the sidebar? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's, I don't want to go next if somebody else has a turn. Oh, okay. Amanda. Um, my question is more based on you. Um, I know you because I had you like two semesters, but... Um, yes, I know you too. <laughs> <laughs> but Good I, to see you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to know like what moves you to continue. Like, I know you worked with mental, mentally ill clients in the past with um, a different organization. I know you continue working with girls and the juvenile delinquency um, institution, mm. and then I know you're continuing at, here at York, and I love that. <laughs> and you can also continue in your research also, so what is, is it that moves you to continue every day and just mm. keep going? Mm. Yeah, it's a, I'm inspired by these narratives. I, I really have, uh, every time I return to these stories, I, I get inspired. And um, like that bread and butter quote, that, that inspires me um, it, it, because it really gets at the root of um, what I'm interested in, which is young women's lives and young women's relationships with each other. And, um, and they know how to say it uh, so much better than I do. And that just captures it. But um, I, I think it's an important topic. Uh, you know, also, I, I, not only do I bring my personal self to this, I bring my professional self and my identity as a social worker. And I believe very, very strongly in the social justice issue. And the idea that um, I'm very committed to uh, bringing young women's voices to the foreground. And that, that ultimately is where it begins for me and wh what keeps me involved. And I think will continue to keep me involved in this area. Yes? Um, I had a question. I just uh, thought of it. But this is something that I have been interested in also. Um, did you find in doing this research that the, the ride or die you know, idea or kind of mentality was a result of some sort of deficit at home, like whether it was, mm. you know, I'm, I'm loyal to my friends because I don't truly have mm. a family or, you know, I, I okay. have to, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm fighting all the time because to gain attention from boys or mm. whomever, someone to love because I didn't have a dad at home or someone to love me. Did you find mm. any of that in your research? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is yes, I did. Uh, the ride or die phenomena did emerge as, I think, uh, um, when, when girls talked about adopting their friends as family, it was to enhance and supplement their own lives and the, the various female figures that played important, significant roles in their life. Um, a lot of the girls I talked to were, were involved in, well, uh, well, we were involved, had group homes, lived, lived in group homes, and there were histories of abandonment, neglect, uh, abuse. And there were also some girls, um, I'm thinking uh, four out of the 19 were involved in gangs. And, you know, the ride or die was about that uh, loyalty um, to uh, sisters and sisterhood. Um, but friendships that became part of your family identity. And again, this was part of my core and the way that young women talked about their connection to that core. And those friendships were direct connections to who they were and how they identified themselves. So that, that yes, the willingness to do that and, um, was related to that. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned, you mentioned gangs, and that sparked something else in my uh -huh. head. Um, did, you also mentioned that a, a lot of your uh, the young ladies were college bound. Some of them, yes. Some of them, and expressed some kind of remorse, or mm -hmm. you know, um, did any of them reflect um, poorly about gangs? Like, did they did mm. they only come out with with you know feelings of this is my family and and things like that, or did they have negative things to say mm. about 
why they why they went into gangs or what happened as a result of them getting into gangs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was so interesting because, um, you know, when when they were talking about this, there was always ambivalence. There were always mixed feelings about what was happening. It was never all good or all bad. And they talked about um, sort of uh, uh, a conflict that they had within themselves about these loyalties and um, their uh, involvement in these gangs. And also, while also at the same time having a very clear understanding of the implications and the consequences and knowing that they're bad, um, some young women felt stuck. In one case, there was a situation where, you know, there was a family history of gang involvement and criminal uh, involvement, activity involvement. So there was uh, a sense that she didn't feel like she had the choices. And so she was struggling within herself um, as to what to do and how to get out. And they talked about ways to get out and um, dying being one of them. And the, uh, you know, but they always talked about them as being foolish and having arrived at a place in their maturity where they just didn't respect it. They just didn't. You know, they didn't enjoy this. It was feeling stuck. Yeah. Yes? Um, first, I, I, I want to say that I so appreciate how poised you are in oh, responding you. very authentically and meaningfully to all of our questions. I thank just you. Really Dr. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. It's refreshing and I've been really informative. Um, I just want to pose two other uh, questions about your research. One has to do with uh, whether you looked for and or found differences between the Latina and the ethnic American girls. That's one mm -hmm. thing. Um, and the other is, you know, whether you asked questions to also, it's clear that you asked questions about their involvement in perpetrating the violence. Mm -hmm. Did you also ask questions about being the victim of the violence mm -hmm. and, and what did you find? Oh, that's wonderful, yeah. Um, in terms of the differences between the two cohorts or subsamples, um, you know, there was a, a more African American young women in the study uh, than Latina, and the Latina young women that I spoke to were all uh, had a history of uh, juvenile justice involvement, and that wasn't the case for the Latina, uh, yeah. the African American young women. Um, um, so, it, you know, again, we're not talking about generalizability, but if I were to look at just these three, um, they were uh, at higher risk for uh, recidivism, you know, re-entering the, the system. Um, they had, uh, um, one of them uh, had a child, um, which wasn't always the case for, uh, not always the case for the African American uh, young women. And so, um, there, um, I think that, in general, they felt to me that they were at, uh, there was more risk in their life history. Mm -hmm. um, I think untapped, um, I think one of the limitations of the study is that I am a monolingual uh, English-speaking um, researcher. I don't speak Spanish, and I think there's a lot to understand about the experiences of, of Latina young women who are Spanish speaking and the experiences of coming here, um, what that's like, right, experiences of immigration and migration, um, which they talked about, particularly in one case, the, the, the migration back to and from Puerto Rico and the relationship with Puerto Rico. Um, and so, I think that um, it's really uh, a, a, an area that's wide open for f further uh, exploration. Um, and I'm thinking about your, uh, your other yeah, question. Oh, uh, yes. Um, the, with qualitative research, I was, a I was asking broad questions about the phenomena. Um, I didn't classify or pre-classify categorize young women either way as either or. I think 
in qualitative research, we're again looking for the multiple realities and experiences. And so by asking the broad questions, you get a much more complicated version of reality, which is that it's not about this dichotomy or uh, uh, of victim-perpetrator. Um, that essentially young women are involved as both. And that their perpetration is about their victimization and that that makes them become involved in offending. And so um, I think that's what's wonderful about this methodology in terms of looking at experience is that it doesn't uh, attempt to um, dichotomize experience or reality. They were both at different times of their lives um, and acknowledge that as such. And so I, I think it's um, an interesting issue and question as well. Yeah. I'll, yes. I'll make this the final question. Okay. Okay. I have one part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Three parts. Out of, <laughs> out of the 19 are, women you interviewed, um, how many of them were gay? Uh, these, uh, there were six. Six. Did you find them to be more aggressive than the straight women or less? Well, interestingly, um, in, they actually identify as uh, AGs. Uh, aggressive girls, and it's a uh, it's an identity with within lesbian identity um, that speaks to their gender nonconformity. Okay. Um, the idea that they were women, uh, they loved being women, and they didn't want to stop being women. They weren't trying to be like men, um, but that they um, had a, a a masculinity about their being fe <coughs> feminine. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, <coughs> their identities uh, were masculinized, and they believed and they knew that the culture supported this view of them as masculine, trying to act like men. But that in reality, you know, that was part of their fight <coughs> to correct this, to say, no, this is, I'm a, I'm a girl, you know. And these, so there was no desire to transition, for example, to become a, you know, transgender or to, to identify um, as men. And so, it, again, it complicated their experience. And a lot of their experiences of harassment <coughs> and, and aggression were related to, directly to, and feelings that they were being profiled by the police also um, for their uh, uh, tra gender transgression, not not being in conforming to their gender. So again, another interesting subsample um, that you know would be wonderful to look further into and explore further into. But thank you so much for the interesting <laughs> Thank you.